Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. We've just gone past six o'clock. Uh, I see Tammy has joined us, who is our, our speaker for tonight. Uh, Mandy and David, I'm not sure if you want to open up the session. Thanks, Chris. I just had to find my unmute. Um, can you hear me tonight? I've changed uh, speakers. Yes, it's much, much clearer tonight. Thank you very much. Um, welcome to everybody again on the uh, session, um, and uh, we hope you have a, another good learning experience. I again uh, want to apologize um, for the spam messages, but it appears that there's a problem between the, I, the um, iPhone and, and um, Outlook. Um, that is a new problem, a new bug that has been found that creates a loop and sends it to everyone. So we've deleted those uh, messages and uh, we hope that you won't receive them anymore. Somebody had a beautiful fire on in the background. I wish I was in your house, Anna, Anna Hersel. Um, very beautiful fire in the background. I wish I was in your house. And I'd like to hand over to Tammy Bailey Stanton, who's a critical care fellow and a specialist emergency physician, currently the head of Rahima Musa um, Hospital ED. Um, I've known her for a long time. Um, and uh, we try to get our local people to be involved in, in this training session. Uh, Tammy, would you like to take it away? Sorry, Mandy, if I can just add in one quick comment before Tammy starts. Uh, I have deactivated the ability for participants to unmute themselves just to make sure we know any disturbances during the session. So if you wouldn't mind, please just raise your hand during the session uh, and we'll pick it up and then uh, we can unmute you so that you can then ask your question. Uh, but Tammy, over to you. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much for the warm um, greeting and welcome. Um, I love Mandy and David for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you so much, guys, for putting me in the hot seat. Um, I hope that this is going to be a really simple introduction. I must be honest, um, when it comes to most things, um, I like to keep things simple. Um, so much like most emergency physicians, if I can teach it in a simple way, if I can understand it in a simple way, that's the best thing. Um, and when looking at ventilators, there's often thousands of buttons and thousands of alarms and lots of different values and squiggles going on on the machine that can be really scary. Um, I hope this talk helps to make it a little bit more simple. So the aims of ventilating a patient um, are actually pretty simple. Um, the first one is we want to ensure that the patient is adequately oxygenated um, and assist with ventilation, which also refers uh, pretty much to CO2 clearance as well. So we're looking at um, oxygenation and ventilation and delivery of oxygen to tissues is a different issue. We're hoping to improve pulmonary gas exchange. One of the other main um, reasons that we ventilate somebody is to decrease the work of breathing. Um, uh, so much so that we would like to rest the respiratory muscles, especially somebody who's got severe ARDS um, and who might be doing an incredible amount of uh, work, a, a large amount of energy expenditure, um, which uh, demands a large output from the cardiovascular system as well and can tire a patient. So those are some of the main aims. And the main aims of ventilating someone is not quite the same as the main aims of intubating someone. So somebody who needs airway protection might need intubation um, and thus they might need ventilation, but it isn't necessarily the main reason for ventilating. Um, so these are also our main objectives is to achieve uh, adequate gas exchange and decrease the work of breathing and thus the energy expenditure of the patient, rest the respiratory muscles. But we also want to be very mindful of how we ventilate because we want to prevent injury um, caused by the ventilator. So we want to prevent VILI, a ventilator induced lung injury. Um, and that's an entire talk all on its own, um, but having a basic understanding of modes of ventilation, um, an approach to ventilation, 
um, and uh, being mindful of how you set your ventilator uh, is very helpful in preventing ventilator induced lung injury. Um, so when it comes to ventilation modes, there are conventional modes and non-conventional modes. Um, I'm not really going to spend a huge amount of time going through each kind of mode. I'd recommend that you guys have a peek on YouTube, any or attend any of the online webinars to take you through each of the specific modes and some of the benefits. Um, but I am just going to give us a broad overview to the different modes. Um, when it comes to conventional modes, you're going to find a whole bunch of terms depending on the machine in front of you. But essentially, there's two main ways of ventilating a patient. And that is either by pressure targeted ventilation or volume targeted ventilation. Even with conventional modes, there might be some mixing of the modes. So there might be a mix um, of uh, your, your mode in front of you. So you might be doing a volume targeted ventilation, maybe with a pressure um, assist um, or pressure support. Um, so mixing of modes is, a, is, a, um, is another thing that's uh, possible. The, the slide in front of you is just looking at the most typical modes that we come across. So control modes are a very outdated mode um, that we don't necessarily uh, have very much on modern ventilators. The original uh, machines, the original ventilators were control modes. So a pressure control mode or a volume control mode would we'd set the ventilator and it would deliver that specific uh, dialed in volume or pressure regardless of what the patient was doing. Um, if they weren't good at sensing, they were not good at synchronizing, and which is why there are very old modes that actually we don't find on modern ventilators. The modern ventilators, what we do find, are assist modes. So they might still be written pressure control, but actually if you ask your technician um, or any of your reps, or uh, especially the sisters who work with you where you're working, you'll find that even if it's written PC pressure control, um, it's actually a pressure assist control, which is actually a really kind mode for a patient because it has a synchronizing function. And you can get a volume assist control as well. Um, which is essentially uh, also a volume targeted breath as well. The SIMV modes have been replaced largely um, by some of the more modern machines um, having better modes, so the smart modes you might find, for example, on the Hamilton. Um, but the SIMV modes were proposed originally um, to be possibly weaning modes, for example, a patient who has been paralyzed in theater, and if you set to SIMV mode, um, the, and the patient hasn't been reversed, the patient uh, will get uh, control breaths delivered as set by the ventilator. And as soon as the paralysis starts wearing off and the patient starts to breathe again um, and uh, is taking uh, their own breaths and starts to trigger the ventilator, then pressure support breaths can be given. Um, I must be honest, SIMV mode is one of the modes that is commonly used, especially in emergency departments um, or in the wards. Um, because it's an older mode that a lot of our staff are fairly familiar with. But I'd like to encourage guys not to use an SIMV mode because it's very complicated and I'll show you why a little bit later. My advice is if you're not familiar with a ventilator, rather stick to the conventional modes of pressure assist control, volume assist control, or pressure support modes. So pressure support modes are the modes where a patient is breathing spontaneously and you might just need to assist the breath um, to decrease the work of breathing, but the patient sets their own respiratory rate. Um, so it's not a mode to be used if the patient is taking inadequate breaths um, at an inadequate rate, or if the patient is wildly tachypneic, um, that patient might actually need further assistance to decrease the work of breathing. 
Um, the one topic that I, I'm not really going to touch on is non-conventional modes of ventilation. And those include high frequency oscillation, frequently used by our pediatric and neonatal colleagues, um, and uh, other modes like APRV. Um, and although they are widely discussed in the literature, especially around um, some of the evidence coming out about how to ventilate a severe ARDS or patients with severe uh, COVID pneumonia, um, some of those modes might be recommended, but my personal preference is if you're not that familiar with a ventilator, stick to the simple modes. Um, for example, pressure assist control, volume assist control, because they're the easiest to understand. Um, and especially when the patient is not doing very well and you're having to prone patients and looking at analgesia and sedation for the patient, my personal preference is, is keeping it simple. Okay, so when you're looking at ventilation graphics, I always ask what kind of ventilation is going on? What have I chosen? What's the mode? What exactly am I looking at when I look at these squiggles on the screen? Um, and does it make sense to me? Please don't be mesmerized by the squiggles on the machine. The patient will always tell you clinically what is going on. So if you can see the patient is panting and really working hard to take breaths, you need to obviously be worried about an ET tube obstruction or inadequate ventilator, ventilator settings. Um, if you're able to listen to a patient's chest, you'll be able to hear if the tube has gone too deep. Um, you'll be able to clinically pick up if they're wheezing. So my advice is always look at the patient, look at the level of the ET tube, um, look at what's going on, figure out when were they last suctioned, and go through like a, a, a nice step-by-step -step, uh, process when looking at somebody who's deteriorating on the ventilator rather than spending hours looking at the graphics. But the graphics can also be of assistance when you're learning how to ventilate. Okay, so most of us are familiar with lots of tubes, lots of lines going on wherever we're working. Um, so it's important to kind of also do pattern recognition when you're ventilating somebody. Just to kind of uh, have an introduction to the graphics, we've got scalars and we've got loops. So scalars are like this, um, the graphs, and the loops are like our upside down flips when, when, when we were learning about um, uh, lung, uh, lung testing. Okay, so scalars pretty much look like this. Um, you've always got a pressure time, a flow time, and a volume time curve. Um, the loops, you always get a volume over pressure, which is the compliance curve or the compliance loop. Um, and you can get a flow volume loop as well. Um, and I'm going to chat a little bit more about the loops later. Right? When you're looking at um, ventilator graphics, it very much depends on what mode of ventilation you're doing as to how the graphics look. So the appearance of the waveform really is dependent on the mode of ventilation. And I'll, I'll show you why. Okay, so if we're talking about volume targeted ventilation um, or like a volume assist um, or a volume control ventilation, this is where we are setting the ventilator to achieve a desired or targeted volume. Um, and the appearance of the uh, graphic will depend whether it's volume cycled or time cycled um, in volume targeted ventilation. Um, and what that means is uh, you might um, have, you might set a pause or so an inspiratory pause um, to allow a little bit of a time for the gases to equilibrate um, between our fast and our slow alveoli. Um, or you might not set any inspiratory pause time at all. Um, so these are the graphics of how a volume targeted ventilation will look. And you'll see they look quite different from the pressure targeted ventilation. And the main difference is actually, if you look, comes down to the second row, the blue graphics. And that's the flow time uh, scalar. And of all of my scalars, the flow time scalar is my, my favorite because it gives you a lot of information about the patient, um, how they're handling their breathing, 
Um, and also it gives you a good clue as to what kind of ventilatory mode I've got going on in front of me. Now the very fancy modes can also change their, um, their flow pattern as well. But traditionally, the, this is pretty much how the pressure targeted and the volume targeted ventilation looked. You'll see that the, uh, the volume time curve at the bottom uh, is pretty similar um, between them. It's the top ones that look the most um, different. Okay, so when we're looking at volume targeted ventilation, this is a patient that um, does not have an inspiratory pause dialed in. Volume targeted ventilation is really nice if you want to achieve a specific target um, uh, of volume and is frequently used for patients, for example, with a severe status asthmaticus um, where you've got really significant uh, bronco uh, constriction and you're not certain of being able to achieve adequate tidal volumes. Um, I'm just going to see if I can play this graphic again. So what you'll see going on here is as the patient is receiving a, a breath, you can see this patient is not breathing spontaneously. It's purely ventilation, uh, ventilator breaths. There's PEEP in the background. So you can see there's a PEEP of about 10. Um, as the inspiratory valve opens, uh, pressure is delivered to the patient. Um, up until a set uh, volume is achieved. So this is volume cycled, volume targeted ventilation. Once the volume is achieved, the desired volume is achieved, the inspiratory valve uh, closes, the expiratory valve opens, and the patient exhales. The flow time curve is very typical of volume targeted ventilation because the inspiratory valve opens, the patient receives a fairly um, a similar flow um, uh, during the ventilation as the uh, volume is being given. This is where the inspiratory valve uh, closes, the expiratory valve opens, and then you'll see the, there is flow and it's occurring in the opposite direction. So this portion here is all exhalation. Um, this is a mode that is great, for, especially for a paralyzed asthmatic patient where we haven't yet broken the bronchospasm, for example. Um, but it's also not the most favorable mode necessarily that's physiologically tolerable to a patient. However, if you know volume targeted ventilation and you know how to do it, it's a great mode. You must just remember to monitor your pressures and set your limits and your alarms accordingly. Much like if you're doing pressure targeted ventilation, you have to monitor your volumes to make sure that they're adequate. Okay, so this here is an example of a patient that is being ventilated by pressure targeted ventilation. The patient has still got a background peep of about eight. The inspiratory valve opens and there's this very typical box shape appearance to the ventilator graphic. The patient, um, the inspiratory valve opens, a set pressure is achieved and maintained, the inspiratory valve closes and the expiratory valve opens and then exhalation happens. This is the flow time curve that is very typical of pressure uh, ventilation. And you'll see what happens is the patient uh, receives a positive pressure ventilation. So the flow goes up immediately and this is all inspiration here. And you'll see there's this decelerating flow pattern that is very pleasant for a patient. And it's why, one of the reasons why pressure support or pressure assist control modes are very nicely tolerated by patients because this is very similar to how a patient or we breathe as well. So if you imagine trying to inflate a balloon, right at the beginning, you might need a large volume or a large pressure to inflate the balloon initially. Once you reach that sweet spot where the balloon is inflating beautifully, you don't need to use as much pressure to achieve a distension. Um, so it's very much like what happens with us. We might take a big breath initially, to open up all those small collapsed or atelectic um, alveoli. And towards the end of the breath, we don't necessarily even need to, it's, we don't need to have that much flow, even though it's part of inspiration. So this decelerating flow pattern is very physiological and it's 
pleasantly tolerated by patients. Um, Okay, pressure support also has this decelerating flow pattern um, when it comes to their graphic. Um, and you can tell that this is a pressure support mode because we've got exactly the same boxy shape that you find with pressure modes. Um, you can see that it's a support mode because the patient is triggering their own breaths. Each of these is a trigger. Um, and obviously, when you're looking at ventilators, you can either set a pressure trigger so the patient has to generate a certain amount of pressure in order to uh, generate a pressure supported breath, or you can set a flow trigger. Um, and when the patient um, generates a certain amount of flow, that will uh, also generate um, the pressure. They have the same decelerating flow pattern, and you'll notice that, however, it does come to a pause. Okay, to a, sorry, to an end um, part of the way through. And that's one of the values that we might set. So flow cycling um, is something that you'll find in a pressure support mode. And all it means is where we come to the end of the pressure supported breath. Um, because the patient is breathing spontaneously, you might give them longer to exhale, or you might give them a shorter time, depending on what is comfortable for the patient. And this is a more complicated setting that you can look at, but just be aware that usually the ventilator spontaneously, the sorry, the automatic um, go to is about 25%, but you can decrease it or increase it according to the needs of the patient. And this is an example of a SIMV, um, which is a synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, if you look at the old term. Um, and SIMV was originally volume control mode. Um, so here, this is an example of SIMV, volume control or volume targeted with pressure support. And you can see there's a whole bunch going on on the machine and on, this, on the graphic, which is why I suggest don't use SIMV, rather use pressure assist control or rather use volume assist control. And you can see there's very different things going on with the flow. This is typical of a volume uh, flow pattern. This is typical of a pressure flow pattern. So essentially there's two different kinds of ventilation happening. You can see the pressure curves are also different and that's exactly what is happening. There are two completely different modes requiring a lot of extra settings um, that's pretty complicated um, um, and, and also it's not easy to necessarily even follow the graphics nicely what's going on. The one thing that you can tell that might be a problem on this screen is that uh, the pressure that is being achieved, um, you can see the pressure here is higher with the control mode as is the volume, whereas here the pressure supported breath might not be adequate. So they would obviously need to adjust their pressure support level for it to be an adequate pressure supported breath. And if this patient has actually got a really nice spontaneous respiratory rate, there's no reason why this patient couldn't be moved actually across to a pressure support mode. There's no point for the SIMV. Um, so this is an example of a SIMV mode, pressure control or pressure targeted ventilation with pressure support. And here you can see the pressure support settings are completely inadequate. Um, tiny volumes being produced here. Um, also, one of the things that we have learned about patients that are getting ventilated for too long, as in the ventilator is doing too much of the work for too long for the patient, the patient gets um, diaphragmatic muscle um, atrophy um, and, uh, and also this can prolong the duration of ventilation. So it's one of the reasons why the SIMV modes are not recommended. If you can breathe spontaneously and the patient is not too distressed onto a pressure, um, a spontaneous or a pressure support mode and if the patient is needing uh, further ventilation because they are having a severe ARDS or it's still early in the phase of their illness, rather have them on a assist control mode. Just one thing to remind us, compliance is the change in volume over the change in pressure. You might see some of this, uh, this terminology in the literature when you're reading about compliance, um, especially with regards to ARDS. Um, also, just bear in mind that especially the European literature talks about elastance. Elastance is the inverse of compliance. So one over compliance is elastance or the other way around as well. So elastance is the change in pressure over the change in volume. 
So if you're looking at the loops, uh, this is pretty much what compliance loops, if you turn to the screen, it's, it's looking at our compliance. And you'll see here, this is um, uh, looking at inspiration. So this curve here is inspiration and this here is expiration or inhalation, exhalation, bearing in mind that this is positive pressure ventilation. So the green part is a normal patient with normal lung compliance. And this is the lung hysteresis curve. You'll see that how the um, graphic looks going up on the inspiratory curve is quite different to how exhalation looks. And it's looking at how the change um, in pressure is, uh, or the change in volume is affected by a change in pressure. So this patient on the pink side is requiring much higher pressures to achieve the same volume. So let's, if we plot a point here on the green curve, this patient needs, the green curve needs much less pressure to achieve the same volume. The patient on the pink curve needs much higher pressure to achieve the same volume. So this patient here has got decreased compliance. And if you were to plot a static line from the top to this, the bottom part, that would be the static compliance of the lung. And the fact that the curve or this loop is over to its side and coming to this side means this patient has got decreased compliance. For example, somebody who's got stiff lungs like pulmonary edema, really bad multilobe pneumonia, ARDS. Um, so that's a patient with decreased compliance. This yellow curve, somebody's got increased compliance. So for the same, um, amount of, uh, or for, for the same tidal volume for this patient, they are requiring much lower distension pressures to achieve the same volumes, which means this patient is at high risk of over distension. And that's also abnormal. So somebody who's got COPD, se severe emphysema with um, uh, destruction of the elastins, so they have coalescence of their alveoli and destruction of the lung tissue, can be at risk of over distension. We know they're hyperinflated and they've got increased compliance that can also be pathological as well. Um, so often with the COVID patients, we'll find that they have significantly decreased compliance, much like patients with really severe ARDS. Okay. Um, and the patients who've got decreased compliance are going to have much higher pressures. The alarms might start going, um, and we might need to adjust our ventilatory strategy in patients who've got decreased compliance. Just a little uh, look at the flow volume loops. I'm going to recommend when you're next at the ventilator, just have a peek, flip to the loops just to see what's going on. It's very much pattern recognition. Airway secretions is very typical. Um, somebody who's got an obstruction of the large airway, uh, you can see that we don't return to baseline. Um, you can see that obstructive airway with gas trapping, we're also not returning to baseline, and this patient would um, uh, have a dynamic hyperinflation. Restrictive lung disease, um, you can even see just by the graphic how skinny and restricted it is, we're not getting nice volumes, we're not getting nice, um, and it's requiring a large flow and we're not generating a nice volume. So these are all pattern recognition and I'd recommend just to have a peek. One last thing that might seem a little bit boggling is the equation of motion. And what it means is just looking at some of the factors that when you're looking at how to adjust a ventilator that might be contributing to the high airway pressures, especially if we're alarming. The pressure in the entire respiratory system um, can be affected by the pressure in the airways, so in the, the airways, or the pressure pretty much in the respiratory system. So this part here is tidal volume over inspiratory time, which is flow. So flow in the airways times by resistance is the pressure in the airways, this portion here. And the pressure in the entire respiratory system can also be affected by your tidal volume over your compliance or your tidal volume times by your elastins. Don't be confused about that. Um, and also PEEP left in the system as well, so positive um, end expiratory pressure. And the, and the way that I like to understand this is in order to have fluid moving from one end of your hose pipe to the other, you need to have an empty hose pipe at the one side, open to the air with very low pressure, and the other side high pressure generating water, and that's how flow goes. So if you were to kink, 
part of the hose pipe that would increase your resistance and overall would increase the resistance in the airway. So this talks about the airway pressure and the airway alarms or the pressure alarms would be going up. So if you've also got a patient who has got decreased compliance, and uh, so they've got a really bad ARDS, this, va this value here, which is looking at the pressure in the entire respiratory system, will also go up and the airway pressure, uh, sorry, the entire pressure in the system will also go up as well. If a patient has got dynamic hyperinflation and the intrinsic PEEP is going up, also, the pressure alarms can be alarming because the pressure in the entire system might go up. So this is just a nice equation for when you're trying to figure out what are the different components of uh, the pressure and especially when you're monitoring patients and pressure alarms. A really nice tool to use, um, if especially those of you who've got a Hamilton ventilator, there's an online um, simulator, which I would recommend if you guys haven't had a chance to look at, go and have a look. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to go back. Go and have a look because it's a really awesome uh, tool to play with. Um, and there's another really nice resource. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Um, I just want to see if I can get there. Openpediatrics.com um, has got a really amazing uh, online simulator with um, cases that will talk you through troubleshooting the ventilator. Um, and I just want to show you guys because they're really nice case studies um, that I really recommend you guys to go and have a look at. And you'll see it's free. So you just go into the Open Pediatrics, the ventilator simulator. It'll take you through a whole bunch of um, learning stations, so you can go through the learning stations, and you can even see it'll take you through waveforms, um, and there are also case studies as well. So if I just give you guys an example, um, adult case studies, uh, it, it will actually give you a clinical case that you, with uh, a patient You've got to listen to the patient, check the ET tube, have a look at the circuit. You can ask for the vital signs of the patient and the, connect the end tidal CO2. You can change the ventilator Sorry, Kelly. Kelly. Yes. Sorry the, the, the presentation is frozen. Oh, and no. so I don't think anyone is actually seeing what you are oh, no. okay. presenting. Is it possible to maybe go back and try again? I, I will. I can try again. Um, I should be... Hang on, hold on, uh, resume share, there we go. Um, Could you maybe unshare and then share again? Yes. Yeah, there you, there you go, there you go. Sure, I'm, just, um, I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to try again um, because I want to share this. Okay, let's see. Um, this is the screen that I want to be sharing. Um, let me, sorry about that. Screen share, uh, desktop. There we go. I think this is going to work. Sorry, guys, about that. Yeah, that's a tip. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I'm so yeah. glad. <laughs> um, so openpediatrics.com, and you go into the simulate, you go into the training mode. Um, let me just show you. I'll go back there. Uh, so openpediatrics.com has got a free online simulator um, where you can go into the simulator. And it actually takes you through a few teaching stations and how the simulator works. We'll take you through different waveforms. But what I want to show you is really nice. Um, uh, there's case studies. So there's pediatric case studies, adult case studies, where it gives you a blurb, so like an actual pa a patient case. And you will need to come and adjust the ventilator um, according to the patient needs. So if you see, I can adjust the ventilator and accept it. I can change the PEEP and go up um, or go up to whatever PEEP level I want. Um, I can change the delta pressure. I can change the respiratory rate as required for the patient. Then you can have a look and ask for vital signs. You can connect the entitled CO2 and see what it tells you. Um, you can also ask for a blood gas for the patient. You can listen to the uh, chest. You can look at a, um, a requ request an x-ray. You can try different modes that you think would be appropriate for this patient and actually physically adjust the settings. And then as you continue through the case, the teaching will give you some feedback 
on how you've done with the case and how you could have improved your ventilation for that patient, um, which is really cool. It's such a nice tool. I encourage all my um, registrars and colleagues to use this uh, online simulator. So the Hamilton is really cool. And um, online pediatrics actually takes you through cases. There's also an adult case, um, uh, adult case study, and they'll take you through an adult case COVID, um, which is really nice. Um, and I think pretty much, I think I've come to the end of my talk. That's the last thing I wanted to share with you guys was um, the simulators. Any questions? Uh, so if I can just remind everybody, thank you so much, Tammy. Uh, but if I just can post a reminder just to raise your hand, uh, as we see your raise hand, I'll then un unmute you manually. Uh, it's just that we don't unmute everybody at once and then have uh, a lot of interactions. You can also type your questions on the side and then we'll raise them verbally for you. Hello, anybody got any questions for me? <laughs> Annie, I see a, a question there for you. Can you share the Hamilton link again, please? Oh, yes, sure. Let me, let me do that. Um, uh, resume share. Um, sorry, just trying to see. Can you guys see my screen? No. Let me try again, sorry. Um, is it possible to type it um, in the yes. conversation side from everybody? Yes, sure. I can do that. Um, and as soon as I've got it up on the screen, I'll also put it there for you guys. There we go. I think this should work. Sorry. I'm a little bit slow with this stuff. Wish I was better. I'm still learning. Um, I think that should work. Is that is that working? Is my screen sharing? No. No? Okay. All right. I'm just going to copy it and paste it into the comment section then. All right. If that's okay. Chat. Uh, there we go. There's the link. No? Okay. Any other questions? While I'm being retarded over here. <laughs> uh, I think you're just nervous because uh, I feel it's a bit daunting. Uh, but maybe I think to remind everybody, there are no stupid questions and everything is welcome. We have a very broad audience uh, across all kind of skill levels and skill sets. Uh, so feel free to ask anything you'd like. Uh, Amy, I see a question here from Julian Jacobs. Uh, okay. Any ventilation mode that is more beneficial uh, in COVID patients? Um, so I see that you guys have got a, is it an oxylog? Is that right? Or is that somebody different asking a different question? Um, well, it's a similar question, but just a follow on from that first question. So, so my advice is choose the mode that you're the most comfortable with when you're starting. Remember that, especially if you're in the emergency department or if you're in a transport environment and ventilation is not your, um, your familiar place, if you usually do volume control ventilation because you work in a day theater and you're very comfortable setting volume control, then choose a volume assist control mode and set um, your alarms accordingly and make sure that you're achieving good tidal volumes. Remember, if somebody's got ARDS, you want to uh, make sure that you first uh, start them off on probably six mils per kg and you might titrate down or up accordingly, but I would always recommend starting at six mils per kg and if you've started at a volume control, just look at your pressures. Mm -hmm. um, 
Personally, I prefer to start a, a pressure assist control mode because I find patients are a little bit more comfortable on it, but you're still going to be giving them analgesia and sedation anyway to assist because ventilation is uncomfortable. Um, I would not recommend starting APRV in the emergency department if you've never done it before. Um, and it's a complicated mode. Um, even for people who work with it um, in ICU, um, it's, not a, it's not an easy setting for when you walk away and you are leaving behind a sister or somebody else to look after the machine if you're not used to it. Um, Prof. Richard recommends APRV and they use it every day in their unit. So that's different. It's an ICU setting where they're using it all day, every day. They're very experienced at using it. Their sisters are experienced at using it. Um, that's a different setting entirely. Remember, that's a really highly skilled ICU. So I would recommend use the mode that you know the best because you're less, less likely to stuff it up. <laughs> yeah. I hope Thanks, that answers the question. Uh, I hope so. I, this is a follow-up, uh, I'll let you know. It seems like most of the questions are actually really around what is the best mode of ventilation uh, yeah. and what is best to use for COVID patient needing ventilation. There is a query around where can we read up on APRV? Um, so I'm trying to think where, I know there's a lot of resources online. Um, if I find a specific one, I will share with Mandy or with David to share with the rest of the group. Um, I unfortunately, I've got a, a lot of articles on it, but maybe I'll find a really nice YouTube video on how to set APRV. Um, and unfortunately, I can't give you a one size fits all because each patient is different. It is nice to learn a recipe. So you'll start a patient on a PEEP of 10 and a respiratory rate of between 14 to 20 if they're an adult patient, tidal volume of six moles per kg. Obviously, you try and drop your FiO2 as quickly as possible. The sooner you can get them to an FiO2 of less than 60%, great look at your ie ratios um but you know the the starting recipe you don't set a vent and then walk away you set a vent and look at the patient and fiddle and adjust and have a look and see how the patient is tolerating it have a look at your alarms have a look at what tidal volumes are actually being produced at the settings that you're setting um what pressures are being generated um and and not every covid patient is the same some patients are being ventilated uh, because they're a trauma case and they have incidental COVID. Um, and that patient you might need to ventilate as a trauma patient. A COVID pneumonia is a very difficult patient to ventilate. Um, and you're going to be using a whole bunch of different strategies to try and um, maybe recruit the patient, definitely prone the patient. You'll be uh, trying different modes, but I, from my experience, uh, especially if you, you're, you're not there at the bedside 24 seven, especially if you're walking away, these patients change very quickly um, and sticking to a simple mode. So if you've chosen pressure assist control, stick it out. If you've chosen volume assist control, stick it out. Don't keep chopping and changing between modes. It confuses your staff, it confuses your juniors and it doesn't help the patient. Um, bearing in mind that I only have minimal experience. I'm not a COVID expert, um, yeah. Thanks, Tammy. There's another question, and uh, I'm not sure if uh, not being a COVID expert will make it hard to answer, but I think you're definitely more expert and more seasoned than the rest of us. Um, the question is, is it helpful to lengthen inspiration time by adjusting IE at the start? I don't recommend it at the start. I, I would still recommend an IE ratio of one to two because your patient might not be a severe COVID ARDS with a cytokine storm. They might be an early COVID pneumonia that requires a fairly normal um, lung protective ventilatory strategy. Um, so I don't think it's a good idea to, to do an inverse or adjust the IE right at the beginning. Um, that might be a strategy down the line. Um, somebody else asked a question about recruitment. Oh, there's lots of different ways to do it. The easiest for a patient is, so if you're going to recruit someone, you need to remember that, first of all, you need to see where is their optimal PEEP. 
um, and then you need to recruit them and keep them there to keep the peep up. Just by putting the peep up, it doesn't necessarily um, it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, achieve recruit recruitment. I always tell my juniors, if you do not know how to recruit somebody, please phone and chat and we'll do it with you. Otherwise, if you're stuck in the middle of nowhere, a peep table, those high peep, low peep tables um, by the ARDS net, um, that's ARDS uh, on, uh, so the ARDS net online um, is very useful and actually is very beneficial. So if you don't know how to do a recruitment, just print out a peep table and stick it on the wall. So, and, and it gives you a range of peep to set for a very high FIR2. Um, if you do need to recruit someone, please bear in mind that um, it is not without complication and in the hands of a, in, a person that's not good at it or experienced can actually cause significant um, problems, for example, pneumothoraces, um, hemodynamic instability, and even death. So it's not, a, um, it's not a procedure to try out for the first time, maybe on a COVID patient. I would recommend going and spending some time with somebody and learning how to do it. Um, a patient needs to be well analgesed for recruitment, and if they're a severe ARDS, they need to be sedated. They mustn't be spontaneously breathing because it's going to interfere. The simplest way is to do 40 for 40. So set your um, PEEP to 20, set your driving pressure or your delta P to 20, and you hold it there for 40 seconds. It's uh, very often the old way that our anesthetists do it. Uh, they just sustain squeeze. Um, uh, so 40 for 40. Uh, so total pressure of 40 for 40 seconds. Obviously, if the patient desats at any stage before the 40 seconds is over or they become hemodynamically unstable, you need to stop the recruitment. There's various staircase maneuvers as well, where you can increase your PEEP and increase your driving pressure at the same time um, in a staircase fashion. Um, uh, so it's often tolerated a little bit better if the patient is hemodynamically unstable to do a staircase maneuver because it's not as aggressive, um, but it can also take a little bit longer. Once you've found the sweet spot for your PEEP, um, and you'll look at things like the FIR2, does it jump up? Um, if you're looking at the compliance, there's actually values on your screen, on your ventilator. Does the compliance improve? So you can have a look and see where you get the best compliance for the settings as well. And then when you found the best PEEP, you need to re-recruit them. So that's just how to find your optimal PEEP. You might do a staircase maneuver, find it, and then go back and actually recruit them and keep them there. The one thing to remember is if you've done a recruitment procedure, maybe you started off with a PEEP of 10, you can't go back down to a PEEP of 10. You must leave them on a higher PEEP at the end of the procedure. Otherwise, it's a pointless, a pointless exercise. Always, if the patient desaturates at any stage in a recruitment or becomes hemodynamically unstable, you stop. What you do look for is either a jump in the lung compliance um, accompanied by uh, an increase in FIO2 to, to see if it's successful. You get patients that are recruitable and some that are not. If you've done a good recruitment procedure and you did not achieve any recruitment don't do it again. You can cause uh, lung uh, sorry, ventilator induced lung injury by trying recruitments multiple times. So if it doesn't work, that patient's not recruitable. If you guys are looking for a really cool way to, or a nice resource to describe the staircase maneuver, life in the fast lane, um, recruitment procedures. Thanks so much, Tammy. Um, I think I haven't seen any, any other questions come up. I'm not sure, David or Mandy, if you have any other comments from your side. Uh, no, um, Chris, I don't have any comments from our side, but I do see a, a comment from uh, uh, Greg. I don't know if you want to unmute him, if he just wants to embellish on that. Uh, it is helpful to lengthen the inspiratory time by adjusting the IE ratio. At the start, Tammy, I might have missed it because I had one or two issues. Did you yeah, just I mean, we, ratio? We, we chatted about it, and it's definitely a strategy down the line, but I wouldn't change the IE to start because actually by doing good ventilation right at the beginning, um, 
you might achieve uh, good oxygenation for the patient. Um, of course, it is one of the strategies, but proning the patient is probably the best way to recruit a patient. I know we've, we've spoken about how to do recruitment with the ventilator, but actually proning the patient recruits the lungs of a ventilated patient and an awake non-ventilated patient the best. Thanks, Greg. I hope that answers that one for you. Chris, I don't know if there are any more questions. If there aren't, um, can you please tell us where these, are, where the series will be available for people to download? Uh, thanks, Mandy. So I still have to just make sure we upload. I'm just processing all the videos. I do have the first video for last night's session available. Uh, so I, we will send out more information. I'll send it out via email. To everybody that's registered, uh, it will likely be hosted on the NetCare website. We should just make sure we have everything configured and ready for those videos to upload. So we'll circulate that information separately. Uh, the key is to please register for the sessions. And once you've registered, we then have your details and we can circulate the information appropriately. But I think that's it from my side. Uh, yeah, just thank you so much. Sorry, Chris, if we can just.